Shay, speaking of uh, Super Bowl and, and Super Bowl champions, we spent some time this morning talking about Rex Burkhead. Okay. Uh, what, what was a top moment for you in your Rex Burkhead, um, either covering days or even fandom? So, uh, like, sometimes you got to reveal, uh, give a little peek behind the curtain of what it's like to be in the in the media and see the same people all the time at the same practices. And particularly during the Bo Pelini era, when practice was supposed to end at, like, let's say, 5.15, and we didn't get in to actually interview guys until 6.30, because that's just how you – know, the concept of time was lost on him. Let's just say that's one of the many reasons why I don't mind that he's not Nebraska's coach. Anyways, nobody cares about that aspect of it. You find yourself in a lot of conversations. Well, back in the uh, – when Nebraska used to go to bowl games, Andrew, and that was a thing that did happen around here for a while, uh, I covered the Capital One Bowl in 2011. Nebraska, or, well, I guess it would been January 1st of 2012. Um, Nebraska plays South Carolina – Wait and a second, they the, played in January at one point? Yeah, nah, well, a couple times. It was, wow. it was wild back then. You had to really kind of pace yourself. You couldn't get all your anger out by the 3rd of October. So, you know, <laughs> it's it's an interesting situation where you're just standing around, you have nothing to talk about. But we had learned that Nebraska had uh, their players for both teams had an opportunity to do a Best Buy spending spree. And they got like $400 or $500 and whatever you want at Best Buy, up to $500. You go pick it out, and then they'll ship it to you. We, uh, you know, we make some jokes about, like, Rex Burkhead's going to get a coffee maker. He'll get a printer, a scale. Like, he's, you know, because he basically just looks like he's headed to a lifetime of working in an office. He's just going to buy all of this equipment and show up with it play. It was worse than that. We actually get to talk to Rex Burkhead, and we discover the only thing that he wanted, the only thing that he cared about, he bought himself a new electric razor while <laughs> he was on the Best Buy spending spree. And it was like such a, and as he's talking about it, it was like such a total dad thing that out of that, we we created this idea because Burkhead was just a junior and the thought was he was going to be coming back. He would have a Heisman campaign. And we, we basically were pitching Keith Mann and the Nebraska staff that the Heisman campaign needed to be Rex Burkhead, he's just like you. And it would just be like advertisements of him just mowing his lawn. Uh, you know, just like very dad. Like, you know, his, he's like under the hood, like trying to, you know, jumpstart a car. Or yeah, he's changing a tire. Yeah. So weirdly, my favorite Rex Burkhead, Rex Burkhead moments are creating this campaign of which he's just like the rest of us. Uh, but on the football field, that guy was exceptional. I, no one... No one that was that can remember it should forget what it looked like when he came in in the second half against Ohio State. Uh, they had been playing Amir a little bit more, and then they went to Rex. He was phenomenal in 2011 in that second half, just getting every extra yard that they could have needed. The 2012 game against Iowa where there was a just, I don't know, 80-mile-an-hour winds at Kennick Stadium and no one could really throw, no one could do anything. Just your traditional Nebraska-Iowa football game where <laughs> offense looks like it was left outside the stadium. I think he had like 36 carries that day. I mean, they they used him in a fashion that we don't see in college football a lot. People like me clamor for Nebraska to have a running back that you can just get 20 carries for, let alone a guy like Rex who could absolutely put it on his back. I mean, he was great in the 2012 or 2013, I guess, Capital One Bowl against Georgia. He was the best player uh, for Nebraska that day. I mean, they didn't play particularly well, but he was really good. He's just one of those guys that, you know, he was in that era of Roy Halu, Rex Burkhead, Amir Abdullah, and you just knew Nebraska was in good hands. You knew that football was in good hands. You didn't expect turnovers. You didn't – you expected big plays from the running backs. I mean, he was just one of those really exceptional players. And you didn't know what his NFL career was going to be, but he's just – he's a perfect New England Patriot. Like, I know he started with the Bengals, but it really felt like the Patriots is where he kind of earned any cachet. And it was because he could play special teams. He could do all the little things that, you know, a guy like Bill Belichick would absolutely love. Uh, and I just have the utmost respect for how that guy grinded out an NFL career that I don't think a lot of people expected. We're talking with Mike Schaefer from Husker 24-7. All right, let's go from past Huskers to future Huskers. I know Matt Rule is supposed to have a press conference tomorrow because, you know, it is National Signing Day. Um, but what's he going to talk about? I mean, we we pretty much know who's coming already, right? Are there are there any is there any 
names on the horizon, even walk-ons that you're kind of looking at that, that might get announced tomorrow? Well, I think there's two names to, to keep an eye on that are sort of in the NIL scholarship or true scholarship level. Keona Wilhite, over the weekend, uh, he looked very heavy to UCLA, and I'm talking about a defensive lineman out of Arizona that had previously signed with Washington. Kalen DeBoer left. He was in, released from his um, NLI. That is always confusing. <laughs> um, and so he's released from his national letter of intent, which allows him to be re-recruited. Nebraska had offered him before, hadn't really like built the relationship at that point, but they dive back into this thing um, with Terrence Knighton and immediately they're in the mix. They get an official visit. He's here for a few days. The family loves it. The family loves Matt Rule. I mean, his dad, I, I should have the quote ready to go. His dad had like one of the better Matt Rule quotes that you're going to have from a parent or a player that, um, you know, if you're in Nebraska, you're just working that into literature for parents going forward. Um, and they had this great visit, but the connection to UCLA was really strong. And then everything with Chip Kelly started coming out. And this is a guy that already left Washington because he wasn't going to have Kalen DeBoer. So then I think it became, I want to go somewhere where I know the coach is going to be. Matt Rule and Jonathan Smith, he was also considering Michigan State. Uh, those are the two guys that you know are going to be around for at least a little while, or you expect they're going to be. So it it made sense for Nebraska to come back in again and be like, look, here's our pitch. You know who we are. You know where we're going to be. And I think ultimately that's going to win out for them on Wednesday. And then a name that popped up for us last night um, because he was released from – or not released, but he, he ended up decommitting from Wisconsin. I don't think he gets signed there. Kamir Prescott, a safety from – Philadelphia is a guy that could end up as a uh, NIL assisted scholarship player. Um, and he was someone Nebraska had out for the spring game. He's uh, another one of those Philadelphia connections that they seem to have a lot of. And he's a guy, I think, looking for a home. And Nebraska, I think, is always going to be in the market uh, with these NIL scholarship type guys. If it looks like he can play, if it looks like he can develop, and it's not really going to cost you anything that you can't afford it's worth taking a shot on him. And if he goes into the portal after a year, you're not really out of anything. Like that's, that's kind of the critical factor of, of some of this where you take a shot, you manage your roster as well as you can. And if a guy like that decides after one year, you know what, he wants to go back closer to home. He wants to do this. He wants to do that. Great. If he turns out to be pretty good. Great. Like it, it, it's almost, I wouldn't say a win-win, but it's really a no lose situation. Uh, for Nebraska with these NIL assisted scholarships. Shafe, we, we spent some time this morning too talking about what this team looks like in the spring and uh, what sort of attrition we can maybe expect from certain position groups and specifically the offensive line. And I'm curious, in your mind, do you see a lot of attrition happening at that position? And if so, who are some names to kind of watch out for that if they don't have a, a role a starting role next season that you could see them leave I, I think there could be some offensive line attrition I mean I think the two groups where you feel like guys probably have to leave because the numbers are too high are the offensive line like you mentioned and then defensive back and um I don't know I'm never like because it's like I don't want to sit here and just make guesses that so and so is going to leave because mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. and well, I maybe, maybe do this instead. Maybe like try to map out who you think is the starting lineup or what that looks like. Because a, a yeah. big point of that conversation was, should Justin Evans Jenkins be the starter? Or could you imagine Turner Corcoran starting at a yeah. spot instead and J.E.J. is next man up? I, I think if it was me, I would love to see what a Teddy Prohaska, Turner Corcoran, Ben Scott, Micah Mazuka, Bryce Ben Hart lineup looks like. That's a lot of career starts. It's a lot of guys that have played a lot of football. I want to see Turner Corcoran as guard. I've gone on every radio stay that ever has me on. <laughs> and I talk about how Turner Corcoran has been playing out of position for years. And what happens every single spring, Turner Corcoran stays at a tackle position. I, I think he's a good player. I think there's a reason that he was a top 50 player in the country. I think just like Bryce Benhart, people are so ready to give up on him that it's unfair because these guys have been put and asked to do things that just simply – weren't in their toolbox or the offense wasn't set up to do. I would love to see Turner Corcoran at that guard spot. Now, the other end of this is I would love to see Turner Corcoran healthy. That really hasn't been a case for several years now.
So if he can stay healthy, if he can compete this spring, if he gets an opportunity at left guard, assuming that Michael Mazuka just stays at right guard where he played for Florida, um, that's a really interesting offensive line to me. And I don't think that has to be a bad thing for Justin Evans Jenkins, because I just said Turner Corcoran hasn't been able to stay healthy. Like if you are the sixth or the seventh guy on this offensive line, you're kind of minted. Like you're, you're in a good spot here because very rarely do five offensive linemen just stay completely healthy. The one sort of thought that I have is I don't know what's going to happen at tackle necessarily. Like if they have to have a tackle, I guess Gunnar Katula is still probably your backup left tackle. Uh, I don't know who your backup right tackle is necessarily. Um, it's, it's a really, it could be Corcoran himself. So he might end up being really valuable as a swing guy. If you do have that injury, like let's say something happens to Ben Hart or whoever Corcoran ends up at right tackle and Justin Evans Jenkins ends up at, at left guard. So I, I could definitely see a scenario where guys are unhappy with what their role might be after the spring, but I really do think Nebraska sells it. If you're in the top seven, you're going to be really valuable to us throughout the year. So give us a chance. Don't get too upset. Don't go away. And then they have a lot of like freshmen and some of these freshmen are basically going to have to figure out, I got to get going here because they're recruiting past you. I mean, there's some guys they brought in the last two classes uh, that they're expecting to play pretty early in their careers. And they got a veteran group that's going to be leaving after this year. So I think uh, it's a big spring. If you were a freshman last year who maybe didn't do much, you're probably going to want to put some good tape out there this spring. We're talking with Mike Schaefer of Husker 24-7. Schaefer, is there any part of you that misses when there was just the one signing day? And No. <laughs> None. And like, it's not, you know, there's a nostalgic factor, right? Because yeah. I have some pretty cool memories from that day that can't be replicated uh, for the most part. But a lot of it is the way that recruiting works now is so different than even just recruiting in 2017, the last year that you would have had the normal, uh, you know, February signing period, the class of 2017 was the last one. Things are really, really different in the last, gosh, seven years, man. Okay, well, before I get lost on that, um, it, you know, it, it's just the the process has moved up. If, if nothing else, like if you want to get rid of the December period, and I understand some do, create an August one. Like let these kids sign early and stop like the messing around with a lot of this stuff. Like a lot of these guys want to have their decision made before they even start their senior year of football because they want to enjoy their senior year of high school football. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get them to sign, and we already have like, before there's the whole hand wringing of what about a coach movement? We already have that now. I mean, we you already had two coaches that were in the college football playoff are no longer the coaches of their, their schools. Like we're in this movement. It doesn't matter. You had coaches leave after bowl games. You had a coach just go become a defensive coordinator in the NFL. Like it's, there's no perfect time. The calendar does not allow for a perfect time. So do the best thing for the kids and they're already committing earlier let them sign in August, let them focus on their seasons. And then the guys who need the senior film, the guys who don't have a spot to sign, they become the pool that's left. And suddenly senior football becomes really interesting. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, the real fast uh, to butt in, Robbie, you mentioned that, you know, two coaches aren't with their team anymore. It's actually three, right? Because yeah. Saban retired. Yeah, so, so so you have you have just a, a complete. And to be honest, the one I forgot was Harbaugh. I, I completely blanked on that. <laughs> right. So oh, I figured that's yeah, the one. Even, that, wow. that, that, that you uh that you knew right away because of the national champion, but who knows? So, yeah, Shafe, I just had this picture in my head of what a what the state of Nebraska's psyche would be like if we had to wait until tomorrow for Dylan Rayola to actually sign on the dotted line. Yeah. If everything had still played out the way it did in December, like we would have had like several heart attacks at this point. So right. I, I will counter that with, because he would, there's almost no way that he wouldn't be an early enrollee. What you would oh, have okay. is this wild scene of people like media members and everyone standing on campus on like January 3rd for new student <laughs> enrollment, trying to take pictures of, of Dylan Raiola in a puffy jacket walking around looking very cold like that. It, it, that would have been the scene for that in particular. But yeah, for most of these guys that don't end up, you know, enrolling early, I, like just there, there's so much that kind of can happen in the month of January. And then the nice thing is 
it allows these coaches to really kick it forward. Like Matt Rule is going to high school events for 2025s. I think there's a direct correlation between getting guys like Carter Nelson and Grant Bricks uh, in this last cycle because last January, after they signed a bunch of guys, even though they'd only been around for a couple weeks, he was able to go and watch Grant Bricks wrestle and Carter Nelson play basketball. Like you can, you can build relationships and you can make players feel special early, and that helps that part of the recruitment get going. I just can't see any reason why anyone would want February, the first Wednesday in February, to be what it was. I, I understand it from the nostalgia aspect, but that's just not, you know, nostalgia is nostalgia for a reason. It's because life moves forward, and we all have to as well. Shafe, I, I don't like looking too far ahead, but uh, unless we're talking about Nebraska wins and losses next season, because <laughs> I think we can do schedule predictions at any point in time. Uh, but I do want to get a, a, an update on the class of 2025, like just a so-called checkup, if you will, uh, because outside of Christian Jones, who everybody like knows his name, who in the class in state are you keeping a close eye on as, um, you know, we kind of build up to the 2025 cycle? Yeah, I mean, you've got Chase Lofton, who's uh, at Millard and South Dow. He's a really talented tight end. He is hearing from, I mean, he was just at Alabama over the weekend. He's he's definitely someone to, to notice and know inside the state. Um, I am blanking on the name. I will let you guys look it up. There's another tight end who's uh, his first name is Robert. His last name starts with Z. I can never remember the name. Um, he is also a really, really intriguing athlete and someone that Brunts has been locked into for a while now. You have Jackson Carpenter and Pierce Mooberry, uh, as far as in-state guys to, to kind of keep an eye on too. And then of course, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned Christian Jones. And so, and then I've already kind of like kicked it forward to 2026 where uh, Caprice um, Keith out of Bellevue West is, is pretty intriguing to me as a guy who could end up as a wide receiver or as a, um, as a defensive back. Champ Davis, who's really, really good at Omaha North last year, that's a name to know too. So definitely some in-state talent uh, looking ahead. That's Mike Schaefer from Husker 24-7. Schaefer, we appreciate the time as always. We will catch up again well, hopefully, maybe next week or no? No, it's going to be We're a while, out. guys. We're out. We're, I'm out for a while. <laughs> well, this is the last we'll talk to you for a while. Well, congrats on your impending fatherhood, and we will talk to you when you get your head above water again. <laughs> Appreciate it, guys. Have a good one. Enjoy the Super Bowl, Robbie. Thank hey, you. thanks. Thanks, Shave. Raymond Zebert, by the way, I believe is That's the right. name. Not even Robert. Really good job <laughs> by me. Way to finish it strong. Way off. Yeah. See you, guys. See ya.